and I'm working at the Environmental Institute at Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College. Like Caitlin said, I helped coordinate some of these classes. Um, and we have Lucas Humblet here today. He is an Oneida farmer. He leases land down at Big River Farms. Um, and he um, and his partner grow lots of different types of food. And it sounds like Lucas comes from a family of uh, awesome <laughs> food food people. So um, thank you so much, Lucas, for being here. And I'll let you introduce yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Sagoli uh, Swakwek. Hello, everyone. Lucas Nionget. My name is Lucas. Onyoteaga ni Delaguane ni Wagenyo. Waguaho ni Muki Loda. I come from the people of the Standing Stone, also known as the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin. Um, I'm a Wolf Clan member. I'm originally from Green Bay, Wisconsin, but I moved here to Minnesota probably five years ago. And yeah, I started my farming journey, I don't know, probably 2015 or 2016, somewhere in that area. And yeah, I've been farming ever since. I'm hopefully going to keep farming for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah, um, I don't know who said it, maybe Caitlin or Kelsey, but you know, I kind of want this uh don't want this to be too formal or anything you know if you have any questions throughout please feel free to jump in put it in the chat or unmute yourself and yeah it's been a little bit since i've done some presentations so please forgive me if i stumble a little bit but um yeah i think we can get right into this So we're going to be talking about pest and disease management and identification. Um, this will be two parts. We'll have, I'll go through this little presentation first, and then the second part, um, going to kind of walk you through a, a document that I created. It's like an Excel spreadsheet, and I'll be able to share that with Kelsey or somebody, and then they'll be able to share it, to, uh, share it with all the producers. So yeah. Um, who I am, like we said, I'm Lucas Humblet. I have a degree in agriculture. Um, I have a passion for tribal sovereignty through food and through agriculture. Um, I'm a co-owner at Yoel Yaseo Farm, and I have my contact information there. Um, I'll put that up at the end again, but feel free throughout the season if you have questions or want to link up about projects, definitely feel free to contact me about that. And through this presentation or through this little session, um, we're going to talk about how to start identifying pests and differentiating pests and beneficial insects, um, how to maintain our cultural values on a modern productive farm, how to incorporate beneficial insects into your management plan, using the life cycles of pests and your planting schedule, getting an understanding of what intercropping is, and realizing that the first line of defense is seed saving. So yeah, at um at Yoel Yaseo, that's a word in my native language for a good heart. We feel that we need to have a good heart to take care of all the seeds that we have, and we need to have a good mind to take care of the land, and we need to have a good spirit to uh, continue doing what we're doing. So we thought that Yoel Yaseo was a good word or a perfect word to kind of, you know, for everything that we're trying to do. So some of the crops that we grow, we grow uh, your three sisters, like the corn, bean, squash. Um, we grow all your regular market crops, like lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, summer squash, and so on. And we do a lot of seed keeping. Uh, we, do, we try to save seeds from as many of our crops as possible. Um, we grow, I think, over 150 varieties on our two acres, and we try and save seeds from as much as we can. Um, as I said, that uh, seed saving is our first line of defense to fight against pests and disease. Um, an example that I like to talk about for this is, let's say, one year you grow 100, uh, 100 corn plants, some Oneida white corn, for example, and you grow 100 of those. And maybe it's a bad year for the European corn borer, and let's say 95 of your 100 corn plants get get affected by the corn borer 
And those all 95, they all die. But then let's say you have five left that are living at the end of the season. Um, I'm going to save seeds from those uh, intentionally um, with the thought that um, they have some natural uh, pest resistance built already into them. It's already written into their genetic codes. So um, I'm always keeping my mind open and my eyes open in the fields to see which plants are not going to be affected by any pests. And I'm going to intentionally save seeds from those with the hopes that they'll be uh, pest resistant. And, you know, seed saving is, a, is a, how we can continue to maintain our cultural values by honoring the relationships with the seeds. Um, seeds have an understanding of the natural world around us that, you know, maybe some of us struggle to grasp, but those seeds by themselves, they, um, they're able to adapt to different regions and soils and they're able to adapt to different pest pressures. So that's why I'm saying that um, seed keeping is one of our first lines of defense for pest and disease resistance. You know, maybe Heather down the road, maybe she has a variety of kale that she's been growing for 10 years and they're naturally resistant to flea beetles. So maybe Heather wants to share some of that with her, the community members and now everyone that she shared that with, if we all save those seeds with the intents of them being um, pest resistant, and, you know, we just created a pest resistant variety. And I think it's like that for a lot of different, a lot of different crops that we grow. Um, yeah, so for me, um, maintaining my cultural values, that's very important in the farm. You know, I don't want to keep focusing my farm on just making money. I want to still be an indigenous farmer you know, we still have expenses and everything. We still have rent, uh, land costs. So we still do have to be productive, but maintaining my values is very important to me. So a way that I'm able to do that is through um, daily scouting for pests and disease on the farm. That's assessing the entire farm, land, and plants daily. Um, what this looks like is, um, well, this daily scouting helps me to maintain these values by building and maintaining the relationships with the plants and the seeds that we grow. How this looks for us is we walk through our fields every day saying hello and acknowledging all of our plants that we've grown intentionally. We're walking up and down each of our rows and we're stopping at each of our plants and we're saying hi to them and we're asking them how they're doing and we're really um really trying to foster a good relationship with them as if they're humans you know they are spirits and they're loving create uh, creations like that so but while we're going up and down the rows and stopping at each of the plants saying hello to them um, we're also looking looking at all the leaves we're looking at the top sides of the leaves and we're looking at the bottom sides of the leaves we're looking at the stems we're looking at all the flowers and we're looking right at the base of the plants and we're looking them over just to see if there's, you know, any damage, any, um, any bugs eating at the leaves or any eggs underneath the leaves or any infestation or start of diseases. So this is really how it starts for us is we want to um, get a quick start or nip it right in the bud real early if there's any infestation or any disease. So we're looking and we're um, daily scouting just to prevent anything from happening or catching it really early. But then I, I also want to say that we have to embrace the inevitability that um, bugs and disease, it's still going to happen on almost every farm. You know, I visited a lot of farms in my time, talked to a lot of farmers and everybody has pests and everybody has diseases in their crops. There's many things that we can do to minimize it, but I'm only bringing it up to embrace the inevitability so that um, you don't get too down on yourselves. You know, there's been a couple of years where it's like, oh my gosh, these potato beetles, they're just destroying everything. And you try so hard to save your plants and it's heartbreaking, but you know, we can't get too down on ourselves. It's, it's going to happen at some point and we just can't get too down on ourselves. So with that saying that, um, you know, we have to embrace inevitability. I like to talk about trap crops. I'm guessing some of you have already talked about trap crops or heard about them, but I'd like to touch on that again. And 
I talk about trap crops because that's a good way of preventing any infestations from happening, any pest infestations from happening. So what trap crops are, they are, um, it's extra plants intentionally planted for the purposes of attracting pests or animals um, to keep those pests and animals away from some of your other crops on the inside. I'm not saying that one crop is more valuable or more important than the next, but let's say if you had you were gifted five five of these seeds and only three of them germinated, you know maybe you're going to want to plant some sorghum or sunflower, extra corn all around it elsewhere, just to kind of attract those the deer or the raccoon or the boars elsewhere away from those crops that you're trying to protect. So at our farm, we grow a lot of corn. I think about 12 varieties or 13 varieties. Um, we grow only five at a time. We, that'd be too much to grow them all at once, I think. So we only grow about four or five varieties at a time. But we line our entire field with a, a sorghum and sunflower border. Um, I learned that from a previous mentor of mine. And the intense with that was that um, the sorghum and the sunflowers has a little bit juicier, more flavorful um, taste to it to kind of encourage the boars to go to the sorghum and go to the sunflower instead of our corn on the inside of that garden. So there's many different ways to utilize the trap crops. All right, um, timing your plantings. Uh, we need to understand that all insects, they have a life cycle from when they are active, they'll start emerging. Right now is about the time that flea beetles start emerging from the soil and they'll stay active through mid July and sometimes even later. You know, it's weird things are happening with climate change right now, but each of, the, each of our bugs do have life cycles. So we are able to incorporate that into our planting schedule or what our planting needs look like. Um, for example, today we planted about, I don't know, two flats of kale outside and knowing that flea beetles, they could be emerging at this time. We're gonna be, um, we covered all of our kale plants with some row cover, some reme or agribond we covered all those plants right away just to not give those flea beetles any chance to get into those, um, get into the brassicas. And it can be the same for any of the other bugs that are out there. Um, so yeah, knowing that each of those plants or each of those insects have life cycles, knowing that there's a peak season for each of those, um, each of those bugs, insects, and using row covers that'll help keep, um, keep a lot of those insects out of our crops. I have up there encouraging beneficial insects. I'll talk about that in a little bit here, but I brought up that um, the timing our planting because I'm guessing you have all also talked about crop rotation, question mark, yeah. So crop rotation is very important for a number of reasons, but relating to the insects is that if we know that there was some cabbage root maggots, if we had problems with cabbage root maggots in year one, let's take, for example, in bed one, we planted a bunch of cabbage there year one. And if we're moving into year two, those cabbage root maggots, they could still be overwintering right there in bed one. So if we're gonna plant our cabbage right there in bed one, well, then we're just putting their favorite food right up next to them and that's gonna encourage them to keep growing. So we wanna break up their life cycles by moving their food around our plots. So we're gonna switch our bed one to bed two, bed two to bed three throughout the years, just to kind of break up where their, foods, or where their food is with their life cycles. Um, same could be said for any potato beetles, mites, or any borers like that. They all overwinter. And I know for me, we like to we like to put our squash very far away from where we planted it the last year, just because we have a lot of squash vine borers at our farm. We do what we can to get rid of them, but each year they seem to come back. So we're just trying to push those as far away from where we had them the last year as we could, just to kind of keep them away, you know. 
but at the end of the day, it's still going to be inevitable that we're going to get hit with them. But there's many things that we're going to try to do to keep them away. So there's a lot going on in this slide, but, um, you know, I brought up beneficial insects before. Um, that's more of a response. You know, I talk about preventative measures and we want to try to do everything we can to prevent these infestations from even happening or preventing diseases from even happening. But if there's a point where you do need to have a response, there's a couple different things that we can do. And that can either be introducing these beneficial insects or already creating habitat for them. So that's what would be a preventative measure, would be creating that habitat to encourage all those beneficial insects from coming in. Now, um, I think it would be a good time to talk about the difference between beneficial insects and pests. Um, for me, I, I say that uh, the pests are the ones that are going to be eating our plants. They're going to be just eating all the leaves and feeding on their plants, and that just decimates them. So to me, that's what a pest is. And a beneficial insect is going to be a, a insect that, that is either pollinating the flowers, or maybe they're going to be some lace wings that are eating eating some of the other pests or ladybugs that are going to be eating aphids in the greenhouse. Those are um, beneficial insects that are helping us as farmers. So I'm really going to be trying to encourage all those beneficial insects to live at my farm. Um, a way that I do this is we break up all of our crops. You know, we don't have 500 feet of straight peas. We broke up 500 feet. We broke that up every 100 feet or so. We're going to try and break that up with like a, a patch of some sweet alyssum or other flowers, just a grouping of flowers or herbs, just a, another type of habitat to encourage these, um, these beneficial insects from, to start coming in and making a home here. So there's many different things that we can do to create a perfect habitat for these beneficial insects. But if that doesn't happen and you're already getting hit hard with some bugs, then there's also the introduction of the beneficial insects. You know, you can buy some parasitic wasps or lace wings or ladybugs, and there's a bunch of other bugs that you can buy off, off the internet or from your local extension office, something like that. And you can introduce, introduce those insects to your farm. The thing about that is if you're introducing beneficial insects to the farm, um, you're gonna wanna create habitat for those bugs so that they wanna stay there. You know, if you introduce 5,000 ladybugs to your greenhouse or to your fields, they could be gone in a day or two if they don't have a reason to stay. You know, maybe in that day or two, they didn't find the aphids, they didn't find the maggots, and they have no reason to stay because they don't have habitat. So if you're breaking up your crops with flowers and other areas like that, they'll maybe, hopefully they'll keep home or they'll make a home there in those areas. And then that'll hopefully encourage them to stick around. So, um, there's some drawbacks of using sprays like insecticides and repellents like that. I don't think, uh, well, some repellents are not as bad as others, but there's a lot of drawbacks to insecticides. They create superbugs. Um, not sure if y'all have heard about this, but I often bring it up about superbugs. And I relate that to my example about the corn. You know, out of those 100 corn that we planted, there's five of those corn that survived. They, those five corn have a natural pest resistance. Now the same can be said about those insects. You know, if we get, if there's 10,000 flea beetles all over our kale and we spray some heavy pesticide all over our kale, killing a lot of those flea beetles, Maybe you killed 9,950 of those flea beetles, but there could be 50 left. And of those 50, maybe they have some genetics on the inside that make them resistant or adaptive to that pesticide that you just sprayed. And then if those 50 survive, maybe they're gonna create more, you know, have future generations that um, show the same resistance to the pesticide. So I really try to encourage to use pesticides and sprays as like your last resort 
you have to do what you have to do to save your crops, I guess. But, you know, I don't want us to be relying on sprays that there's many other methods out there and we shouldn't be jumping the gun right to sprays to be using that right away. Um, so I was talking about that habit, creating habitat for beneficial insects, right? And that um, that's what some people call inner interplanting or companion planting. And what that is, it's the method of planting two or more crops or flowers, herbs, or plants right next to each other or very close to each other um, that oftentimes bring a beneficial response. So, you know, we plant, we plant our beans right next to our corn because the beans, they're nitrogen fixers and those are putting a lot of nitrogen right there for the corn. So that's a good example of what interplanting is. Or we could be planting lavender or marigold next to all of our corn or our leafy greens like our lettuces um, or planting other aromatics like onions or other things like that next to some of the more desirable crops when they intend to repel um, some of those pests. But we also have to uh, do your research first because there's um there's some crops out there that'll change the flavor profile um i think if it's like if you maybe if you plant onions next to your lettuce or something like that like right next to it i can't remember which crops it are but it does change the profiles of the flavor profiles of that crop so we do want to be a little careful just do a little research beforehand to see if those two plants if they can live next to each other like that but um so yeah, I said like instead of growing continuous rows of corn or of lettuce, break those rows up with crops or other flowers that might attract um, those beneficial habit or beneficial insects and create other habitat and create a reason for all those other insects to stick around. You know, we really want to encourage that. So that's some good inner planting or companion planting techniques right there. Um, this is a fun little meme that I made. Um, I think of this as some farmers out there. Uh, I'm not trying to sh throw shade on every, anybody, but I am going to come out and say it that a lot of people, their first response is to spray pesticides. They're skipping a whole bunch of other steps before they before they're spraying pesticides. You know, they're not putting up physical barriers or they're not encouraging beneficial insects or planting pest resistant varieties. Um, I think that a lot of people nowadays, they get it in their mind that we have to spray just all these chemicals. There's all these chemicals available to us. So that means we have to use it. And I think that that's just not true. Um, you know, sorry if I'm throwing shade on anybody, but this is my opinion that there's many other things to do before we're spraying all these chemicals on our fields because we're eating those crops. You know, these these are our relatives. We want to take care of them in a good way. And we're, they're also wanting to give us their gifts and they want to go to feed us. So if we're spraying a bunch of chemicals on these crops and on these plants, that in turn is going into us. And I know we wash our plants before we eat them, but it's like, I still, I don't know, I have a lot of trust issues with a lot of these things. So yeah, please keep that in mind that there's a lot of things that we can do before, before spraying pesticides and spraying these harmful chemicals like that. So I think this could be an, a good little break time if there's any questions, um, you can write down some of the contact information. I have up here the University of Minnesota's extension office, their email and their number. Um, we utilize that so frequently on our farm. Um, I brought it up before that we do our daily scouting. And let's say I find a cluster of eggs underneath some leaves or I find a bug that I've never seen before. I'm going to grab this handy phone that's in my pocket every day and I'm going to take a picture of that. I'm going to take as many pictures as I can, you know, try to try to get a picture of the color of the bugs or the shape of the bug and the size of it and do all these comparisons so that, you know, while I'm in the field, I might not know what bug it is right then. But once I go home, I'm going to have these pictures of it and I'm either going to Google it myself. You know, I'm going to type in winged bug with blue and orange stripe on it, you know, and try and find the picture of it and go from there. 
or reaching out to the extension office and seeing if they've ever had any problems with this specific bug and if they have um, any recommended actions for that. Any questions currently, or should I just keep going? Um, no questions yet, but I see a good comment. Um, someone saying good info, miigwech. I agree about pesticides. Um, FDL is supposed to be a no spray zone. What is it? No spray zone. We need to, sorry, I gotta make the chat a little bigger. Uh, we need to keep our food and water clean and safe for everyone. Um, okay, a couple questions. Uh, what is a natural way to combat cabbage moths and worms other than a row cover? Is BT a good thing to use? Is BT a good thing to use? That's a great question. That's the Bactillus thuringiensis or whatever that bacteria is. Um, we've tried it before. The BT is a... I guess it's technically a naturally occurring bacteria around, um, you know, I don't, for me personally, I don't have any moral dilemmas with it. Um, we've just tried it a few times and I didn't find it that effective. It works, uh, BT works for, um, I forget the technical term, but it's like soft squishy bugs, like the maggots and the borers. Uh, BT is not going to work for like your beetles and your hard skinned and hard exoskeleton bugs like that. So BT works for all the little squishy, squiggly maggots and borers, things like that. We've used it for corn borers and squash vine borers and maggots. And I didn't find it to be too successful. We still had major crop loss, but that's just in my experience. We could have been using it wrong. You know, that's a big problem with a lot of chemicals is just misinformation on how to use it. And we could have totally been using BT wrong, but you know, I hear other people, they, they use BT all the time for that stuff and it works, but we just don't use that on our farm just because we haven't found that it works. And um, in that same note, diatomaceous earth or DE, that's definitely, uh, we use DE a lot. That's the diatomaceous earth. Um, it's like ground up fossilized, um, I can't remember what it is exactly, but it's very fine particle dust that you spread around your plants. And yeah, I think that DE works fantastic, but it's only for specific types of bugs. You know, I think it works really well for aphids, but it's probably not going to work that good for some of your bigger bugs. You know, I don't know about the squash beetles. I don't know how well it works for that, but you know, just doing the research beforehand to see if that is a compatible um, preventative or responsive measure for that. Um, you talk, or there's another question there about some good plants to help attract beneficial insects. Um, I think now could be a good time to go through this scouting guide. I'm not ignoring that question, but that'll I'll bring that up in in this uh, little scouting guide that I have here. So, um, I made this document a couple of years ago. I was like, kind of fed up with how much different information there is all around out there, and I just re wanted re something really compact to use as a quick reference. So I made this little scouting guide, and I'll be able to share that with all of the producers here. So I'm just going to walk through it just to, if you are using this, you can see how to use it. Um, on the first page, I have a good, I found a good picture about beneficial insects. On the left-hand side, it shows what the beneficial insects are. And at the top here, it shows what the problem pest is. So if we look at the aphids, for example, each of these ones that have an X in it, we draw that to the side and see that, oh, the gray green lace wings or brown lace wings, those are good at fighting away and killing the aphids. And same with beetle larvae and all these other bugs. So let's say we know that we're gonna get some 
hit by some grasshoppers this year, just because you might know that some people might not. But if there's grasshoppers and you know that there's long legged flies over here, if those are the natural predators, we can do some Googling, you know, go to Google and type in how to encourage long legged flies or what plants do they particularly like and where do they make their habitats. And then you can kind of incorporate that into your field plans as to um, how to encourage these specific types of bugs, how to encourage parasitic wasps to come to your farm, you know. At the bottom uh, down here, we have all the different tabs of different, a uh, couple of different bugs. Some of the common bugs that I've had on the farms here in Minnesota. I'll give a brief description as to what the, the bug does, what type of harm it does or what habitats it likes. Um, I give an identification on how to actually identify it. You know, for aphids, for example, there's a lot of different colors and textures of them, different sizes and different shapes. So because there's some variations, I put pictures down here. And a lot of the pictures I like to show all the bugs in their different stages of life. Um, uh oh, Different stages of life. Um, show what the, the parent moths look like, what the males and the females look like. I show them how they are in the plants and what you can, yeah, show them what, where they are, everything like that. Um, up, up at the top, I gave a couple preventative measures that you can do and some responses. If, if you didn't catch them early on, then you need a response. And I give a decent description on how, what different methods you can use to uh, combat them. So, yeah. Trying to figure out how to stop sharing. But, uh, yeah, that's what I got. Looks like there's a couple more things in the in the chat here. Yeah, me and Lucas for sharing your knowledge. And I yeah, I'm excited to take a closer look at the scouting guide. That looks very satisfying to have it all in one place and helpful. Um I don't know if I saw any questions, but if people have more questions, I, it seems like um yeah, you all are dealing with Colorado potato beetles. So I don't, that's a big one at Gitaganing that we've been dealing with. Um, and yeah, I remember being out there for, I don't know, at least a good hour, just like picking off handfuls on some of the plants. So if you have any <laughs> potato beetle specific recommendations. Oh my gosh, no, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't because We've been hit with them so bad and we don't grow solanaceous plants at Big River Farms anymore because populations have gotten so dense and thick there. So we didn't grow any solanaceous plants last year or this year just to kind of keep them at bay. But what we've done, what I've done before is, like you said, manually picking them every day, every couple hours going through and throwing them in a soapy bucket. And I mean, you know, neem oil, that's another, um, I've used neem oil as a kind of deterrent for that. It doesn't kill them, but it's like a, it's like a deterrent, very, I don't know what it does, very aromatic, but yeah, I've used neem oil before. Uh, and then Kelsey is wondering if you have ever had issues with slugs. Have we had issues with slugs? No, not personally. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. We have not had issues with that, so I can't really speak to that. And the I can really speak about the problems that we've had, but past that, I don't know that much about things that we haven't had issues with. So no, haven't had issues with slugs. That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> I had a bunch of <laughs> bunch of slugs in my cabbage last year. <laughs> oh, please. But I, I I've gotten a few tips from people. I think some beer traps might be good. But um, I was just curious if you had any other ideas. 
Yeah, I mean, pheromone, I don't know if it works for slugs specifically, but I, I really like pheromone traps for a lot of the squishier bugs. You know, they're the squishier bugs. That's like the early on in their life cycles and they turn to moths or something else later on. So I think the pheromone traps really helps to catch them early before they start laying eggs. So. And then Steve, yes, the scouting guide, uh, Kelsey can distribute it and we can distribute it to everyone who registered this class. Uh, and then someone's wondering, other than sunflowers, is there a good trap plant for corn? Yeah, um, I like sunflowers and sorghum. Um, we grow a lot of sorghum at our farm and it's, a, uh, I think it's related to grass. It's in the, maybe in the same family, but um, it has, uh, it's very sugary plants. So I think it's kind of sweeter and I don't know if it attracts the boars or other deer, but you know, when we've had deer or other things like that, they tend to go to the sorghum first and then the corn after. So I think mixing up sunflowers and sorghum as the trap crop for corn, that's what we've done and we've had success with it, so. Does sorghum grow this far north? Um, I don't think we're that different of a zone. We might be, do you know what zone you guys are in up there? Is that like a 4A, 4C, something around there? 4A, um, I think. 4A? Is that right, Caitlin and Erica? 4. Yeah, that's about what we're at down here. And sorghum grows fine for us. Um, it might be that it, it's a regionally adapted sorghum seed variety that we have. Um, it could be that, but we've definitely, we grow sorghum all the time and have full harvests of it. So yeah, I'm going to do a little plug for the Emerging Farmers Conference that's uh, at, towards the end of this year. Um, I think it's hosted by Big River Farms or the food group, but I'm going to be, my partner and I are going to be hosted a seed, seed exchange there at the conference. And we're going to bring some of our bigger crops that we have kind of regionally adapted down here so we'll be bringing sorghum just because we get pounds and pounds of sorghum each year so we'll be bringing sorghum and some of our sunflowers and a lot of a, a lot of our other trap crops like that so yeah All right, and then someone's wondering about amaranth. Any experience with amaranth? Oh yeah, yep. Uh, we love amaranth. We grow a lot of that too. I haven't noticed that really as a trap crop, um, but you know it brings in a lot of the po pollinators and there's bugs buzzing around it. But yeah, we like growing amaranth. I've noticed amaranth brings in a lot of birds too. My my plot will be very very busy anytime I have amaranth. That's true. The birds, they definitely eat a lot of the flying bugs too. So a lot of our sunflowers and amaranth, that's good for that. And um, I was hoping you could say, do you, oh, do you harvest it, amaranth? Um, do, you, do you harvest amaranth, Lucas? Yes. Yeah, we harvest it in all stages of its life for baby greens we do a baby green salad mix with amaranth leaves and sunflower leaves very immature sunflower leaves same with amaranth so we do it for that and then we harvest it for the grain later on in the season um so yeah and we have some dark purple ones out at Gitaganing, and we're looking at doing um a natural dye class later this season so hopefully we could tell tell you all more about that soon yeah. Okay, and then any other tips for managing flea beetles besides row covers? Flea beetles are a rough one. Like I said, that re uh, regionally developed or nat um, varieties that have natural pest resistance to it. There are some kales around here. That example that I said with Heather ha having this 
variety of kale. That's a real example. And she's going to be giving some of her seeds to us this season to grow out at larger scale. But um, for preventing them, they're they're a huge threat to some of our crops. And I know that a lot of the adults, they overwinter in brush piles or wooded areas, and that's when they emerge in the springtime. So if you're able to keep some of those brush piles or wooded areas kind of farther away from where you're growing, you know, that kind of help to push them farther away from where you're growing your brassicas. But honestly, when you're planting your brassicas, we put our row cover in right away. We don't even wait 15 minutes. We put that row cover right over those brassicas right away. We don't give the flea beetles any chance to um, any chance to come in. And we do use diatomaceous earth with the flea beetles. Um, you know, after it rains or something, we reapply it. But I think with mixing all of those, we've really figured out a good good method to keep them and to keep harvesting from our crops. So I think using row cover right away, once it's, uh, once you get the plants in the ground, diatomaceous earth and keeping their habitat farther away from where you're growing. Yeah, the part that hits the soil buried. Yep, we, so we bury our row cover and we unbury it each time that we go to harvest from it. Um, we move along in like a 10 foot section, we unbury it, roll it over, harvest from that area, flip the row cover back down, bury it, and then move on. Um, we really want to make sure it's all the way sealed all the way around, that there's not going to be any big tears or cuts in the, in the row cover because they'll find their way in. And if you get a couple in there, then a bunch will find their way in after that. So you break up your row plantings and your method of interplanting. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I guess today, what we did let uh, a couple days ago, we seeded a bunch of peas, um, about 600 bed feet of peas. We break that up every 100 feet and we put a cluster of flowers in there. We really like sweet alyssum. That's a, one of our, uh, sorry, I'm putting this into the chat. We use sweet alyssum a lot. That brings in a lot of the uh, beneficial insects. And I, I don't know if it's specifically parasitic wasps or another predaceous insect, but we use sweet alyssum heavily. But we break up our rows every 100 feet or so. And we just plant a five foot wide, 10 foot long patch of flowers. You know, if it's going to be some Tulsi basil or some Thai basil, aromatic flowering plants like that, stuff that's flowering, that'll help encourage a lot of bugs to come in. You know, if it's flowers and there's nectar and all the pollen and all that goodness for the bugs to eat. And, you know, we're, um, yeah, that's what we do. Um, we planted a bunch of uh, lettuce in between the two rows of peas that we did. So we planted all of our lettuce there at the beginning and the end of our lettuces. We put green onions. So it's like a big old sandwich. We have our peas on the outside and the flowers at the very ends. On the insides of that, we're having our green onions right on the inside of that sweet alyssum. And then on the inside of those onions, that's where we're having our lettuces. So it's just a huge, huge sandwich to kind of keep everything away from our lettuces. Um, we have a bigger contract this year for some of our lettuces and crops like that. So we're really trying to protect those. So that's why we chose to do that with our lettuces all on the inside of it. Um, and we do intercropping and inter interplanting for as much as we can everywhere around the farm. So. And any more you could say about, you know, what planning looks like every year, um, how you're prepared to do all the sandwiches. Oh my gosh, planning is ours. <laughs> you know, it, it either, 
it either happens months beforehand or during planting time. If we forgot something, it's like, hey, should we just move this around, plant a bunch of this stuff here, and then we just do it right then? Or we intentionally plant it all or plant it all months beforehand. Um, so we knew that we had some of these larger contracts a couple months ago. So we were able to plan around those. If we had our contracts for 500 pounds of beet harvests, that's a lot of beets. That's a lot of bed space. So um, I can't remember exactly what we're doing for that. I know that we're breaking those up, though, in the beds with different sections of, I think, basils. We grow a lot of basil also. So Tulsi basil, Thai basil, and Mexican mint marigold. And I think those are our three go-to for when we're planting in the beets and a couple of our other root crops. We're planting those three. And like I said, we're breaking them up in the rows. We're not going to just do one continuous long row of beets, but we're breaking them up in there. So, yep, planting starts months ago. Doing that way ahead of time. Yeah, and it sounds like there's a lot that goes into that. Do you have any advice for kind of beginning producers on where to start? Since I'm sure you get more advanced from year to year, but yeah, where to begin? Where to begin? That's an excellent question. I mean, pick your favorite crops that you know you're going to want to grow. And if you want to stick to 10 or 20 crops that you're going to try to specialize in this year and that you're going to learn everything about, you know, figure out um, what the common pest pressures are for those bugs, you know, just do a lot of Googling or reading books to figure out what bugs are going to hit that the most, and then go from there, figure out how to prevent those bugs, you know, if there's specific, like maybe chamomile, if you grow a bunch of that, that'll keep away some of these maggots or some of the slugs, if you know that there's going to be slug problems, that um i don't know if that answered the question i take it really one step step at a time and go really slow with it so i google everything and read books a lot so yeah well, that sounds good prioritizing and then yeah and focusing on what are you what are you going to eat or what your customers are going to eat and just go from there yeah. um yeah so we have a few more minutes if anyone else has questions um, oops. Let's see. Erica, do you have any questions that come up every year on this topic that uh, people bring up to you since you work so closely with the producers? No, at the farm, the big issues that we have is the Colorado beetles and and we always have the cabbage worm um, and it's the same thing I did have the first and I think the second year at the garden but at the garden I don't have any big issues anymore it's very diverse so it's not really we haven't much uh, bugs around the the ones that we don't want and uh, no, it's just a little bit the cabbage worm at, at the garden, but not really much. But it's, it's very common, kind of sounds like most of the people have kind of the same issues with, with that too. And I know for us with the root or with the, the cabbage maggots, those worms, the cabbage, they, the pupae, they tend to overwinter in a different plant materials. Um, I know that it's helpful for us. It, I go back and forth, but we take up a lot of our plant material out in the fall time, just because there's going to be a lot of bugs that are overwintering on the inside of those, specifically like worms and borers, maggots, things like that. They're going to go inside the plants and overwinter in there. So sometimes taking those out of the field or where you're going to be growing next season, taking them out beforehand. Um, that'll really help with that and breaking them up, like doing your crop rotations around that, uh, that helps with the, um, those maggots.
And then we had a quick question. How do you ID the squash vine boring pests early on? What do you look for? Yeah, with those, um, let me let me see if I can do the screen share again. I don't know. Yeah, with those, they tend to, at the beginning of the seasons, they will um, lay their eggs right around the very base of the squash plants. And so for prevention, people either put little Dixie cups right around their squash plants at the beginning of the year or wrap it with tin foil just to keep those moths, like these are the moths here, they wrap the bases of their squash with that just to keep the moths from even laying their eggs on the plants to begin with. Let's say you weren't able to do that though. Let's say you have a hundred squash plants and you just weren't able to wrap a hundred of your different plants and there's eggs already laid there. There's going to be right, it's always at the base of the squash plant right next to the soil, like a couple inches up. It looks like a sawdust, like a kind of wet sawdust and it's like the excretion from the the pupa or whatever boring into it so if you notice small little pinholes with a little bit of sawdust looking on it then that's pretty much guaranteed you have squash vine borers in there if you're doing your daily scouting and you notice that little sawdust and these pinholes in it um, you can get it early on, but once the effects start happening for from the borers and they eat your entire plant, you're, you're kind of screwed at that point. Sorry to say it, but it happens. Now, what some methods that I've done is I cut my squash um, vertically along the vine from the base where the hole is. Like we see the hole right here. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but... I cut a hole starting at where that hole is and I cut up, up along the, the, the vine of it until I see that borer itself. And then I pull the borer out uh, with some pliers or with the needle or something. So I'm physically removing these borers and in, I tape up my plants right after I cut them open. They should keep growing. If you don't cut horizontally across the squash, you'll be fine. If, or if you cut horizontally across, you might kill it. If you cut vertically or along the vine, then you should be fine. But um, yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yes, base of the plant, sawdust or pinholes. Yep, that's what it is. Well, and since you're part of a bigger farm, does Big River Farms do anything like for the whole farm to help bring in beneficial insects or are there things like that that happen no okay i mean no, no yeah it, we're trying Again, no, to get no that shade change. to anyone i was just curious <laughs> we're trying to get that change like if you are all in a community where you can work together where you have open communication that's fantastic you should all try to be doing that so let's say someone knows that you're getting hit with these bugs right now let everybody else know talk about it say hey we're getting hit with these really hard this year you guys should watch your stuff over there and then maybe a couple days later those bugs are going over there so just keeping that open communication with everybody and you know if you know that everyone in this area is getting hit with potato beetles maybe you don't grow potatoes this year um that's i think a good way if you know that you're getting hit really hard with pests year after year after year then just take that food source out for a couple of years and those populations, they'll either dwindle naturally or they'll just go away finding other food sources. So that's, I think, a good recommendation for those persist persistent um, problems like that. I like the sound of that. All right, so we're about at time. So I just wanna thank you again, Lucas, for taking the time, especially during such a busy, Busy time for farmers and for you all a little more down south. I really appreciate it. And you coming out of hibernation and doing a presentation for us. Uh, miigwech. And thanks for sharing that tool too. That's huge. Definitely. Yeah. Who should I email that to? Uh, Kelsey, did you volunteer? Yeah. <laughs> you can email to me. I'll make sure it gets out. Awesome. Yeah, miigwech. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lucas. This has been so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. I definitely appreciate being here.
Yeah, and thanks again, everyone, for attending. Appreciate it. We will see you uh, next week for the hybrid class. Thank you. <laughs>